For those who don't know me, my name is State Representative Melissa Jebrin. I actually uh, grew up in East Hampton on Tarsha Road. Uh, was a, a student in this building, so I always feel so tall every time I walk <laughs> back in here. Um, but thank you so much for being here. It's really an important issue, and um, we have a panel of experts here who can really offer us uh, a lot of good information everywhere from you know the facts, uh, statistics, to uh, a real story about what it's like to be a family member of someone who is battling uh, a, an addiction like heroin. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce each of them. They're going to uh, have an opportunity to uh, talk to you about what their uh, 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 area of, of expertise is. Uh, we're going to wrap that up and then we're going to start going immediately to questions because this is more of an opportunity for you to get your questions answered, not necessarily a long uh, uh, procedure for us on this end. So uh, I want to start by introducing uh, the Commissioner of Demas, uh, Mary I'm Delphin Rittman. If you can give people a wave. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for being here. Um, and just so you know, the Commissioner was in front of us yesterday at appropriations. We had our budget hearing. Uh, Demas's budget, as proposed by the Governor, is going to be significantly impacted. And after she gave her presentation, she stayed until about 10 o'clock with us, listening to families. And I just want to publicly thank you again for that commitment. Uh, in addition to uh, the Commissioner, we have Police Chief Sean Cox. Uh, next to him is the uh, uh, Dr. J. Craig Allen. He's the medical director at Rushford. Uh, next to uh, Dr. Allen, we have Christy Barber. She's the executive director of the Regional Mental Health Board, who, by the way, was also testifying with us very late last night and uh, actually brought us a box of cookies at uh, 9.30. <laughs> so thank you uh, to Christy. Uh, next to her is Irene Cuck. She's the coordinator, uh, uh, a volunteer for the East Hampton Prevention Council. Thanks for being here. And then next to her is my friend, uh, Kim Richards, uh, who's going to offer you the parental um, perspective of what this looks like. And Kim, uh, I want to give a special thanks to you for being here. It's a, a brave thing for you to get up and talk about your family and your experiences. And from the bottom of my heart, I couldn't be more grateful to you. So at this time, I'm going to pass the mic, and you guys can pass it down as you talk about your areas. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, I just wanted to, to thank you for the invitation uh, to be here. Um, I think that um, this this uh, is such a uh, an important uh, it's it's an it's a crisis. It's a crisis that we're seeing here um, in Connecticut as well as it's a, it's a crisis that we see uh, that we're seeing nationally. Um, so, as you know, I'm the commissioner of, of the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, um, we. Uh, administer uh, mental health and addictions, uh, prevention, uh, treatment, and recovery services statewide. Um, and, and this is something that right now is, is, has been an absolute uh, priority uh, area and a focus of a lot of our attention because, um, you know, people are, are suffering and we're, and we're losing lives. And so we're absolutely committed to um, and really uh, uh, working to do what we can to create a service system um, that is responsive, um, that's strong, and that meets people's needs. Um, and so I just wanted to share a little bit of data. I actually see that the, I'm a fairly new commissioner. I've been uh, at Demas about uh, a year, and prior to that, I was a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Yale. Uh, the professor in me still sort of likes the PowerPoint, but uh, what uh, the energy of the universe in this room is telling me is, you know, let go of the PowerPoint, you don't need it. <laughs> because technology decided not tonight, <laughs> not tonight, Commissioner. So, um, but I will just go through a few, um, it's just some of the things that I wanted to share um, about um, some of what we're doing and, and some of what I think we can all do together. Um, this, I believe, is, is so an all hands on deck um, issue. It's a complex challenge. It's a complex challenge that as a state we're grappling with and as, as a nation we are. Um, and I, I really think that that all of us um, working together, you know, that we all have a role, and there are all there are things that we can all do. Whether you're a parent, um, or a friend, or a family member, or administrator, or me as a commissioner or a representative, I think there's all a role and a place um, that that we can uh, have in addressing this health crisis. 
Um, I was at a, at a um, forum earlier in the, in the week with Michael Botticelli from the office, the White House Office of uh, Drug Policy Council, and he was saying that, you know, in some ways we've seen a perfect storm, uh, a perfect unfortunate storm um, of events that's just created um, this health crisis that's been uh, truly a challenge to address, but uh, that there are innovations and are things we know that, that work. Um, there are best practices and, and things that we know that work. And so I just want to talk a little bit about some of the prevention, um, some of the and treatment and even recovery uh, pieces that we have and what we're working on. Um, you probably all have heard a lot about, um, from a prevention perspective, um, Narcan, that Narcan is, um, it's uh, really been fantastic in terms of being able to reverse uh, people who are in an overdose process. And so we do quite a bit of training of uh, local police departments, of first responders, of providers um, around how to um, administer Narcan. Um, and so that's some of the work that we're doing in terms of prevention. We're also doing a lot around sort of messaging and really trying to get more information um, out around just the dangers of, yes, oh sorry about that, about the dangers of uh, prescription um, uh, drug misuse. Um, or the dangers of, you know, certainly heroin use. Uh, so we're doing a lot of sort of education around that because I think awareness, awareness is really important. Um, we're doing a lot of parenting education as well around, you know, ways to keep medications, um, you know, locked and safe and, and out, of, uh, out of the reach of not just young people but, but anybody. Um, we also do a lot of advertising around, you know, there, there are drop boxes that many of the, the local police departments have and that, that's uh, an important way to um, reduce the availability of prescription uh, medications. So we advertise uh, drop boxes and where, uh, when prescription take back days are happening. Um, those are just some of the things. Uh, but we know treatment, you know, prevention is one piece, uh, treatment is important as well and so we offer a range of um, treatment statewide. Um, Demis, DEMAS as a, as a system of care is, you know, we are the safety net provider uh, in Connecticut. So we work with individuals who are um, uninsured or who are on Medicaid. Uh, and, and that is largely our, our population uh, that we work with. We also fund uh, a network of, um, partially fund a network of co community providers, some of which may accept private insurance as well. Um, but our um, charge really is as a safety net provider for individuals that are underinsured or uninsured uh, on, on Medicaid. Um, and so I'll go quickly because I know this really is about a discussion. Um, one of the areas that in terms of treatment that um, data really shows is, is a valuable um, best practice is uh, medication assisted treatment. And so um, we have a number of um, medication assisted treatment or methadone clinics statewide. Um, that uh, really are helpful with helping people um, secure and maintain long-term recovery. Uh, so uh, methadone along with counseling, uh, the research shows is, is a, uh, a best practice and treatment of choice for individuals grappling with um, heroin addiction. And so that's one form of treatment that we offer. Um, but we also offer you know, a range of other addiction treatments as well in terms of residential support, counseling, recovery supports. Um, you know, some of our recovery support services and, and what we've learned is that, you know, sometimes individuals in recovery who, who have had um, experiences with addiction or experiences with mental health issues um, can be so valuable uh, when in terms of um, working with or sharing their experiences with someone else to help them in their recovery journey. And so uh, we find a number of recovery uh, programs as well. I'm not going to go on and on, but just wanted to provide a, a little bit of information. You know, I think a, a, another thing that's, you know, that's some of what what we do, um, you know, some of what we talk about in terms of, you know, what we can all do is sort of knowing our, uh, you know, knowing our family members and our kids, you know, talk to, talk to our kids and find out who their friends are and who they're, um, you know, who they might be hanging out with. This, this sometimes can be important. Sometimes kids can be influenced by the people they're hanging out with. Um, my sister recently uh, shared a story with me that, uh, that you know, she has found that it's in, it's important for her to know um, who uh, who her daughter is hanging out with, and that that's been uh, important for her. Um, also, talking with doctors, you know, asking if if a uh, if a prescription is being prescribed, is the number of uh, pills necessary? If it feels like it's there's a high 
um, a high number of pills that's included in the prescription are, are, is that level of um, prescribing necessary. Um, monitoring medication is important. You know, I've heard stories recently as well of people, um, you know, finding that their medication cabinets, that the medications were taken out of their cabinets. So um, people have talked about when they've had open houses, at times their medications have disappeared uh, when people ask if they can use their restrooms. So just, you know, pay attention and lock up medications. And, and when the prescriptions are done, um, it's important to, uh, to return them to drop boxes, prescription take back days, all of that helps reduce the availability. And, um, and I'll, um, I'll stop there, but I just want to say again, thank you everyone for coming. I, I appreciate just this discussion. Um, I handed out or brought a number of resources that I do want people to um, be aware of. Certainly if you go to our website, there's always information there. Um, this is like hot off the press um, today um, because people have been telling us, you know, they really want um, a particular place where a range of services and supports are listed. And so what we have here, these are a listing of substance abuse um, assessment centers throughout the state. Um, and what these do, these will, um, they're walk-in centers, so people don't need an appointment. They're in all regions of the state, and they will um, assess a person and link them with the level of care that's necessary. So for some folks, detox may be necessary. For other folks, detox may not be the level of care that's needed. It may be residential or um, some other form of um, outpatient treatment. So do do take one of these. Um, we're also working on uh, developing a centralized number. You know, at a, at a forum recently, someone said, you know, it'd be useful to have a centralized number we can call um, to if we're having a difficulty linking up with services. And uh, so within the next couple weeks, we'll be releasing that, um, a centralized number uh, where, where a person can call to get linked up with services. And so, um, that's why I think forums like this are so important because that idea actually came from somebody um, that was in the room. Um, and then, you know, certainly tune into our website because we're, we're interested in continually um, sort of disseminating information just to raise awareness, raise awareness about some of the trends we're seeing, about different services and supports that are available, about different recovery supports that are available, and as well as different events and forums that are happening um, statewide as well. So, uh, so thank you. We'll have more time for discussion. Thanks. <coughs> Evening. My name is Sean Cox. I'm the Chief of Police. Can you hear me in the back row? Good. I'm not a microphone guy. Let's get that right off the plate. All right? Um, you ask my children, they say I'm a very effective yeller at times. So that said, I'll be short, sweet, and to the point. Um, what you're going to consistently hear um, throughout our budget season and probably the state's bu budget season is money short, resources are shorter. Um, so I can't help but think what Teddy Roosevelt said. Do the best you can with what you have where you're at. That's what my charge is. So let me be clear, we've got a problem. We've had some people overdose, we've had some people die. We only have a 14-man police department. We're a police department that's also the licensed medical provider. So we're kind of split in two different directions. So that said, I'm happy to report to you that our officers now carry Narcan. They've been trained, they've been equipped, and they're out there on the road. But that said, here's some things I need you to understand. The first thing is I need you to get, pe get people to feel comfortable calling us. Time is of the essence with Narcan. If we don't get there quick enough, it's not going to work. You have to remember, if they don't have circulation, if they're not breathing, we need to move right on to more advanced care. So at the first signs and symptoms, and the signs and sym symptoms are here in the handout, <coughs> take them with you if you have a family member or whatever to better educate yourself. Skin in the game. The expression we use in sports most of the time, I'm here to say we need it in our community. But it needs to be on three fronts. Parents, skin in the game. Start having honest conversations. Start finding out who your kids' friends are. Start educating yourself and then educating your kids. Community. You might think, as a community member, not my kids, not my neighbor, not my neighborhood. Well, guess what? Heroin's cheap. What happens when the price goes up? It's going to have a satellite effect. There's going to be an effect on you. What's going to happen? Crime's going to go up. It's $3 a bag now. What happens when it goes to 10 and you have a 10 bag a day habit? Think about that. Burglaries will go up. Robberies will go up. It may affect you in a very negative way if we don't get out in front of this now. Um, from a law enforcement perspective, here's what I can tell you. We're not going to arrest our way out of this. Absolutely not going to happen. But what we can do is use the tools that we have 
to make it a little bit more difficult for them to conduct business in our community. So to that end, what are we doing? Why, well, here's a secret. If people are doing heroin outside in our community, guess where they're also doing it? They're doing it and they're getting behind the wheel of a car. So we're gonna use our DUI grant opportunities that we're seeking now from the Department of Transportation. And we're gonna to try to increase those DUI enforcement efforts that we have so we can get more drug interdiction stops. Here's the thing. The United States Supreme Court came out with a ruling recently that said this. Even if the officer Spider-Man sense tells him there's drugs in the car and he wants to get a dog there to help confirm that Spider-Man sense, you only have the time that it takes to write out a ticket to hold that operator. So again, time is of the essence to use that resource. One of the reasons why we're, we're looking at a potential canine program. But we're also concerned about a potential rise in criminal activity, so we would like to seek a multi-trained dog, so it doesn't, it's not what they would call a one-trick pony. Um, so we're working on that effort. Um, we suffered a tragedy not too long ago. We lost a very valuable member of our community. He was, um, he was run over while walking on a sidewalk. Uh, I was one of the police officers who went out and helped with the CPR. Um, it was a devastating effect on many of our officers because we had a personal relationship with this victim. That said, uh, the, the operator was charged with abusing prescription medications. The crash occurred on a sidewalk in the morning. It's not a traditional what people think of a DUI situation. Also realize that when people are, are abusing prescription medications, it's harder, trickier for us to detect that. So what are we doing? Well, we've also applied, and I'm trying to get one of my officers to volunteer to become a drug recognition expert. It's a new, very advanced, very difficult course to get. But right now in Middlesex County, there aren't any, to my knowledge. So I'd like to be the first in Middlesex County to provide that service out there as well. What we're doing as a medical provider, again, here's our biggest concern. While we do have the Narcan out there, if we can't get those phone calls in time, right now I spoke to the paramedic who supervises our, our, uh, our training, and he said on average right now we're about four, four and a half minutes from the call for service to us putting an AED on someone uh, for the symptoms of a heart attack. Four and a half minutes is pretty good time. Um, so that said, uh, the more people I have on the road, the better we are to serve you. Um, I'm trying to work with the superintendent now to come up with a plan. It's just difficult given the limited amount of staffing that we have. But right now with no SRO program, no DARE program, we don't have that intel coming in from our school system that we would normally have that other departments enjoy. So while that's on our radar, I don't know if funding is going to support that mission as well. Um, if you have any questions for me later, um, that's the track we're headed on now. Um, so if you see a lot more enforcement effort along the 66 corridor, that's probably what you're seeing from our efforts. Thank you, Chief. I would ask, even though the Chief has a great big voice, our video camera can't get that voice. Thank you. I'm a microphone kind of guy. All right. <laughs> I sit here quietly. But I did like that. That was great. Um, I, I want to just mention, because it's, it's on my mind, it, we've heard about naloxone a couple of times. I've been checking off things that have been covered, and I didn't get to the end of my list yet. But um, with naloxone, Naloxone is now available, and I, I saw it listed here on the, um, the program that there's a pharmacy in the area that uh, provides naloxone, so you guys should all be aware that you can get a prescription for naloxone from a pharmacist who is certified to provide that prescription, um, and depending upon your insurance, uh, unfortunately still it's difficult to get your insurance to pay for it, but if you had a family member and you were, uh, who might be using opioids, then I, mean, I strongly recommend that you have naloxone on board and the pharmacist can do a quick training of recognizing the signs and the symptoms of opioid overdose and then can uh, sell you one of those kits. You don't have to go see the doctor to get it. Um, if the doctor does prescribe it, however, your insurance company is much, much more likely to, to cover it. So keep that in mind. But it's, it's really encouraging to see that there's a local uh, pharmacy who uh, is providing that. That's, what is the name of the pharmacy? Yes, it's in your program. Um, I, uh, I ran out to my car to get a quote that I had jotted down, and I decided I wanted to read it. Um, this quote comes from uh, Sam Silverman, and Sam Silverman is the uh, director of Rushford's Addiction Medicine Fellowship Program, 
one of our addiction medicine fellows is here tonight. I won't point out Dr. Chris Reevely in the fourth row, sitting, <laughs> looking at the ground. But um, what, one, of the, one of the things that addiction medicine fellows, well, they, they learn about prevention, they learn about assessment, they learn about treatment. This is for addictive disorders and co-occurring disorders. And, and then they, they learn about relapse prevention. And so uh, we're trying to get our fellows uh, opportunities to go out into the community and talk about uh, substance use disorders. And right now, you know, what everyone's talking about is opioid overdoses uh, with uh, opioid analgesics, Oxycontin, Percocet, Vicodin, Fentanyl, and uh, talking about heroin overdoses. Uh, so uh, Sam, Sam's quote is, um, non uh, an overdose is a non-intentional accident due to a metabolic inefficiency caused when dose, the amount of medication you're taking in, exceeds the capacity of your body to break it down. And that's similar to any other drug, toxicity, except that with opioids, with heroin and with opioid analgesics, um, there's, uh, it has exceeding lethality. And um, I, I like that quote because it points out the fact that, and it leads into my next point, which is that uh, an addiction or a, sub a substance use disorder, um, it, it is a disease and it goes from uh, volitional use, recreational use, uh, to becoming something you have very little control over. And people say, well, why do you have very low control over it? Over it? You know, and, and traditionally, and hopefully people don't say this too much anymore, but say, well, you know, you weak, weak moral structure or, or things along those lines. Well, you know, what, what Nora Volka, who's a scientist with the National Institute of Drug Abuse, has shown us over the years with MRI studies of the brain and, and so forth is that there are actual changes that take place to the neurocircuitry and neuroadaptations and the neurotransmitters, they change at a certain point when you're using substances. And there's certain people that are more vulnerable to this, and there's a certain time in your life where you're much, much more vulnerable to this. But when those changes have taken place, they may not go back. And those changes affect things, uh, they, they, like uh, the neurocircuitry that controls your motivation, that control your ability to manage your impulses, that uh, control your memory, and, and that control the reward pathways. And that, that's, a, that's the thing that is, um, uh, for me, the most fascinating and frightening thing about substance use disorders is the way that it can take over your brain. But the point that I want to make is that this is a chronic and recurring disease, like other chronic and reoccurring diseases, uh, for instance, diabetes, uh, or uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, or, or other types of abnormalities that require, uh, there's treatment available, but one episode of treatment may not cure you. There are medications available and you might need lifelong medication. So someone who has diabetes and they go on insulin after two or three weeks or after two or three months or after a year, most of the time they're not able to get off their insulin. And if they do, they have a relapse and they end up in the emergency room with diabetic ketoacidosis and blood sugars of, of 800, um, and, and that can be a, a lethal event. Not unlike that, uh, substance use disorders uh, can be identified early, they can be treated with medications, and there may be relapses. Sometimes people don't take their medications for diabetes or chronic obstru obstructive uh, pulmonary disease or hypertension, and sometimes people don't take their medications for addictive disorders. And sometimes even when you do take your medications, you have setbacks with those diseases, those chronic diseases, and sometimes you have setbacks with, um, with substance use disorder. The problem with looking at a substance use disorder as though it isn't a chronic disease, like other chronic diseases, is that um, it creates a culture of discrimination and um, uh, th this tremendously negative stigma that 99% um, of the people that I treat have to live with. So on top of having a disease you didn't want to have, you know, no one wants to be addicted to any substance. On top of that, you have to live with the fact that um, your neighbors aren't talking to your parents anymore and um, you know, no, one, uh, no one's going to give you, no one wants to see you uh, in their yard or talking to their kids, and they're not interested in giving you a job, and you're struggling with this disorder. Um, 
and, and the the two more points I want to make. One is that I mentioned there's a time in your life that you're most vulnerable to developing a substance use disorder, and that is when your brain is still developing, and so that's before your brain is fully developed. People's brains are fully developed. A good number to use is 21 because there's some legal ramifications with that. Um, for males, it's probably a little bit later than that. But I mentioned before, if you can not use an addictive substance till that point in time, it, it's incredibly helpful. Your brain has has either fully formed or is close to fully forming and is um, more immune to the long-lasting effects of um, substances of abuse. So understanding addiction as a developmental disorder is a very important piece. And um, the, the one other point um, that I wanted to make, I am forgetting. So I will uh, have to make we'll it later you. when you guys when you guys get back to me. But I, I want to I want to thank you um, for coming out tonight, and I want to thank the representative and thank the commissioner for coming out tonight because this is a, a very very important topic. Good evening, everybody. This is a great turnout. Really um, excited to see so many people here. Um, my name is Christy Barber. I'm the director of the South Central Regional Mental Health Board, which is Middlesex County and New Haven County. Uh, my counterpart, Betsy Chadwick, works for the Regional Action Council, which is kind of the addiction side. I'm mental health, she's addictions, but we collaborate a lot on, on our work. One of the things that we, we say in our, in our world is that everybody is affected by mental health or addictions in their lifetime. It's supposed to be like about one in four people, but really you're all here for a reason. We're all here for a reason. Um, I'll, I'll share a personal note that um, in my life um, I've had a, a boyfriend who was addicted to a substance, and this is touching a, a, a bit on discrimination piece in that it was much easier for me to say he was addicted to cocaine than it was for me to say he was addicted to crack because somehow that felt a little more palatable to say. Um, similarly, I think with opioids, when you think about pills, prescription pills, well, yeah, they're you know, taking pills. Well, when you say someone's a heroin addict, doesn't that feel a little different? You know, so I think that when we think about, um, about discrimination and how this plays out, that is one key component, is that people get really afraid of admitting something like this because, it's, um, because it has a lot of ramifications for how you are perceived. Um, so when I think about also um, uh, heroin, and, and we didn't touch on this just yet, but there's many different ways that you can snort it. There's all these different kinds of, of ways. It's not just your traditional kind of shooting up as, as, you, um, as you think about it. Um, so uh, one thing about prevention I wanted to mention, and um, Dr. Allen just touched upon this, but if an adolescent doesn't use any substances, um, including nicotine, that's including nicotine, until the age of 18, even if they have a genetic predisposition or a genetic loading, you know, even if you're, you're, you're fa it's in your family, um, they have a 90% chance of not becoming addicted to substances the rest of their life, right? So up until 18, um, you have 90% chance. Um, if they stay away from substances until 21, that chance goes up to 96% chance of being addiction-free in their lifetime. It's a pretty staggering um, statistic if you think about it. So I want to lay the landscape about to you, um, what, I, what I've been kind of wondering in my own, own head. How, how did we get here, right? How, how did we get to this, this, this area? And there's many various reasons. But one of the things I, I've um, noticed um, <laughs> is this direct-to-consumer advertising, right? If you, if you think about if you're in your 40s, 50s, whatever, 60s, w when you grew up, was there an advertisement on television telling you to take a pill? Was there? No, right? But in about the 80s, the mid-80s, drug companies, they used to just go to pharmacists and to doctors and give the information, and then they would send them on fancy trips, and then the doctors would tell you which pill to take. No, that's <laughs> It's true, right? Yeah. <laughs> when I worked at Yale Naval Hospital, they started really cutting down on that. I was like, oh, what do you mean they, the doctors aren't throwing those great parties anymore? But what they did is instead they said, well, we're going to go directly to the consumer and we'll tell you what you should take, right? So a part of this with the, with the FDA um, is that um, this has been happening and we have been, you just see commercial after commercial, you know, uh, 
just off, awful things that I think um, little ones should not be seeing, you know, um, different types of, and, and all of us really. So that direct marketing um, is, is a, one layer, one layer of effect. I spoke with a representative, uh, Rosa DeLauro, who came to the last opiate forum, and she is really trying in Congress to um, to get that made um, illegal, right? That the, the direct to consumer marketing illegal because uh, we need to have a voice in that, and you are you're all constituents, and I think that we need to rally against this. Cigarettes used to be on television. Are they anymore? No. Why? because we rallied against it, right? So we need a similar kind of rally, I'd say, in this, in this arena. Um, secondly, in the last form, I learned a very interesting point about in, in about 95, the doctors created the whole pain scale, like on a scale of one to 10, you know, what is your pain? Well, I don't know, it depends on what your scale is, right? But, but also what they did is, if you were on the upper levels, the opioids were, were the thing to, you know, to prescribe to people. I recently have had a shoulder injury, the most painful thing I've ever been through, darn bicycle. But I fell off my bicycle and I separated my shoulder. For months, it, it's been unbelievably painful. What did the doctor prescribe? I've had Dilaudid and Percocets and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, let me try this, you know, because I don't, um, I was in intense pain and I needed it. but. The doctor was very freely prescribing pretty much anything I said. Where we talked about being educated, at one point I said, you know what, I really don't like the way this makes me feel, or it's giving me a severe headache. And so he said, well, I, I said, is there anything that's a non, like, non-narcotic? He's like, well, we'll trauma it all, we'll try that. So, but I had to ask for that next level, is what my point is there for you. Um, uh, Betsy just did a, a forum with, with the kids uh, in, in East Hampton here, right? And, and, and she, one of the things that the, the, the kids said was, um, you know, do your parents monitor how you're taking that, you know, Vicodin or Percocet that you were given? Are you kidding me? They don't monitor it. All their the prescriptions are out, all mine are out. There's no, no monitoring. So at, at home where we talked about knowing, that's a really important component. Um, and the kids kind of laughed, actually. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is, um, is pain and suffering are normal components of life, yet we've created a medical solution to life's inherent ups and downs. And that's one thing I think when I think about mental health and how we cope with things, it's how do we cope with life's challenges in a holistic way, and instead of looking at that solution in a, um, a form of, of some type of methodology. I mean, we all might say, oh, let's go out for a glass of wine, I'm really stressed, right, or something like that. But it's at a level now where I think people are um, numbing themselves um, and numbing themselves from life. And when it's affecting our children, it's time to say we don't want this anymore. We, we can't have this um, as, as, a poten as a solution. So I think, um, I think that's all. One other thing is how expensive these are, right? So kids, a, a grandmother, we did a forum in New Haven, and she said that her, um, her grandchildren were selling her pills for them. Why? Because how much are pills? $20, $30 a pill. Right, so you look at how much these are on this, you know, the street. That's why the heroin's cheaper, right? So you're now doing this, and the heroin is is cheaper. Um, I think the body's resilient and amazingly resilient, and so when you see how how much people's bodies can take of these opioids, that's what kind of scares me sometimes. Listening to um, some of the addictions sides. One other note: when I did have the addiction issue um, with my boyfriend in my life. Um, support group was the best thing that I ever did, and it was Naranon at the time. So I know we're going to get to questions and answers, but I just wanted to, to mention that, that that, you know, there are support groups, and that, that's one of the ways to, to get help as well. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Irene Cook, and I am a um, parent volunteer for the local prevention council here in East Hampton. I am not a microphone gal, but I will use it tonight. Um, I first joined the uh, council about 10 years ago as a parent and a member of a civic organization, and then I stayed on as a parent, and now I'm actually a staff member here at the middle school. So I'm not a prevention professional. Um, we're all volunteers on the council, 
but we support programs that su provide education and awareness of alcohol and drug addiction. We're also trying to provide information and opportunities for prevention and alternative programs, especially to the young people here in town. Um, we greatly support an organization here in town, Epic Arts, um, because they have um, one of the few outlets for the youth here in town where they can gather in a, a drug and alcohol-free environment. Um, many of the programs that we do are aimed at middle and high school students, um, but um, other programs and activities can be sponsored to be geared towards um, young adults and older. We are a very um, flexible organization. Um, it was just this week that um, we, um, that MEXAC facilitated a teen focus group. Um, we had um, a group of uh, 12 boys and girls um, come together and um, some key things that became apparent out of that group was um, how easy it was for them to obtain either prescription drugs or heroin or, or anything else. and, and knowing where they could get it. Um, about half of the dozen had taken pills, and then again, how easy it was um, to to even intermix their prescriptions with parents' prescriptions, or how easy just everything was available. Um, and also that in general, there's quite a bit of poor role modeling going on for those young people. <laughs> Um, at our meetings, we discuss uh, current drug abuse. We have conducted uh, drug abuse trends. I'm sorry. We have conducted student surveys uh, at the high school and at the middle school. We try to develop programming specifically for East Hampton, um, and uh, also try to shine the light on at-risk behaviors that could potentially lead to substance abuse. We welcome anyone that's interested to attend the meetings or offer suggestions for programming. Currently, we're meeting the last Tuesday of the month. Our next meeting is coming up on March 29th, I believe. Um, we're funded by a grant from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, which is administrated via our Regional Action Council, um, Middle se Middlesex, County Substance Abuse Action Council under the direction of Betsy Chadwick, who was here tonight. Um, and then um, I just wanted to say on a personal note what being on this council has done for me as a parent. Um, I always had a thought that experimenting with drugs for my children would be something that all kids will probably do at some point in their life and um, that it was almost a coming of age thing. But since my involvement in this council and learning that um, even a trial with drugs can, be, can cause instantaneous and irreparable damage to their developing brain has kind of led me to have really frank talks with my kids saying that it's not an option to even try. You know, you like your way your brain is now you have a responsibility to preserve it, and I have a responsibility to, to make you aware that, that these things are just bad, right? Um, so anyway, um, the other thing that the council feels strongly about is to change people's perceptions that it's okay to take prescription drugs that are not prescribed to you. Um, I've heard so many heartbreaking stories. Being part of the council, people tell me stuff. Um, for example, um, you know, a star soccer player on a college scholarship who took a pill from her teammate because she was injured, and um, you know, was was able then to go on and practice and play through her injury because she was on this narcotic painkiller and became addicted. Um, Another um, angle that cannot be ignored is the, that connection to mental health. Um, I've had um, family friends who, whose uh, brother basically uh, self-medicated with drugs because he had mental health problems. Um, you know, it ended up that he uh, was bipolar 
and and ended up um, we think he ended up committing suicide by stepping out into traffic because and he was in his late 40s um, so we would like to encourage um, continuing these community conversations about this crisis um, I feel that community education and awareness about this crisis and the disease of addiction is so important in combating it. When we are at our meetings and we're saying, you know, we've had speakers come in about talking about marijuana and the effects on teenage brains and, you know, we have maybe five people in the audience and um, it seems like we're preaching to the choir. But I also think that just a general community awareness and education that will lead to the understanding of mental illness and addiction as a disease that requires treatment will go such a long way to um, create empathy for the addicts in our community. We need to overcome the ignorance and shame and stigma and secrecy, which is the most common way that families and their communities deal with this problem. So there's been an ongoing conversation uh, on Facebook um, since uh, this, this date for this forum was set. And um, just tonight, a, a gentleman said that he had wanted to come, but he couldn't. And, um, and he said that, uh, he, and he's been clean for three years. So he said, but relapsing for years, um, he had been relapsing for years, and that he thinks a big part of it was that he, uh, that he was ashamed to shed light on the fact that he was an addict, and admitting that he was an addict was key to his recovery. So if the community would like to have some kind of support group um, you know, the LPC is all behind it, trying to get it off the ground. And um, I look forward to your questions, and hopefully we can um, keep um, this conversation going. Hi. My name is Kim Richards. I'm not a microphone person myself. Suck it up, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> you talk loud. Um, I, to be honest with you, I struggled with the system with my daughter. My daughter is an addict in recovery, um, and there's, we need, I, I just feel with my experience, which I'm going to talk about, is things need to change. There's too many people dying out there. <clears throat> I'm a parent of an adult daughter addicted to opiates. It started six years ago when she took opiates, a prescribed prescription for her pain. She liked the feeling of euphoria while the, taking the pills and that it washed the physical and emotional pain away. Following that prescription, she continued to pursue additional pr prescriptions while thinking she would no way get addicted. The opiates at first would get her through the day, make her feel confident, would take away her anxiety she was dealing with due to depression. She started doctor shopping and incorporated <clears throat> muscle relaxers, benzodiazepines, I had to practice that all day, <laughs> into her daily use. <clears throat> Eventually, like so many others, she turned to heroin and sold her soul. She lost a potential career in nursing with dropping out of school, her home, her job, and most importantly, her daughter. By the grace of God, my daughter has been in recovery since October. I'm here not to only speak on behalf of my daughter and my family, but also every family out there going through this living hell with trying to save our loved one from dying of an overdose or relapsing. <clears throat> I've struggled honestly with the system, being medical hospitals, doctors, mental health, and judi judicial. Upon Representative Zebron asking me to join this panel, my media, mind went immediately into overdrive with thinking, I have so much to say, and how am I going to demonstrate why the system didn't work for me? I decided to just simply state the facts of what I had to endure. My life of pure hope began when my, 
while trying to get my daughter help. I was watching my daughter fi fall into a dark world of addiction. I started with confronting the doctors prescribing the pills. One being a psychiatrist that was overly prescribing Xanax. I left word for him demanding him to stop prescribing the sedating drugs. The doctor responded by accusing me of violating my daughter's right to privacy and <clears throat> violating HIPAA rules. My response was, I am, your parent, I am your patient's parent, not her clinical provider, and according to HIPAA, I can give you the information about your patient. Also, according to HIPAA, you can take my information without violating patient confidentiality. You just can't share her, her medical information. I also asked him if he was checking the prescription monitoring program because my daughter was doctor shopping with getting Xanax, opiates, and muscle relaxers from two other doctors. I told him, you and these other doctors are going to kill my daughter. I later found out this doctor told my daughter that I was toxic to her well-being. If I wasn't so devastated by watching these doctors contribute to my daughter's addiction, I would have laughed at the irony of this statement. My daughter overdosed on two occasions, the first time being she melted down Oxycontin and injected it into her arm. She recognized that her breathing was becoming labored and thank God she was coherent enough to call 911. She ended up hospitalized for a number of weeks due to an infection from the needle getting into her bloodstream. The infection also affected her heart and lungs. What I found unbelievable was she was getting injections of morphine for the pain during her hospitalization. I understand she was in pain, but the doctors in the hospital knew she was an addict by the very apparent track marks on her arms. I did not question the doctors at the time because I thought for sure they would wean her off the morphine and refer her to drug treatment. This did not happen. She was discharged with scripts for pain meds and was told to follow up with her doctor. She did so and was able to attain additional scripts for opiates. I witnessed her second overdose of muscle relaxers in my home. Her so-called pain management doctor prescribed her 60 muscle relaxers and she took 30 of them in a short span of time. She was having seizure-like symptoms. She was rushed to the hospital via ambulance. At this point, I was at my wits and with the stupidities of these doctors prescribing all these meds. At this point, okay, I have to I have to give the doctor in the ER working that night a thumbs up at Middlesex Hospital. She spoke up and said, I am ashamed to be a doctor with all the medications these other doctors are prescribing to you. The meds you are on could kill an elephant. It was the first time I heard a doctor speak truthfully about the absurd overprescribing of controlled drugs to my daughter. The doctor also committed her to the hospital psych unit. However, at that point in her life, she was not ready to accept treatment and she left a week later. I would not let her come home. I made the painful decision of throwing her out of my home and was not to return unless she was ready to commit to getting out. There came a time when my daughter finally became tired of the streets and wanted help. Her fear was the pain of withdrawals. I learned from her and other addicts that being addicted to an opiate eventually stops being about getting the euphoric high. It's about keeping yourself from getting dope sick. It is the biggest fear of addicts. It is one of the many reasons they will not seek help. One young man in recovery stated to me, I wish all those that have never been addicted to a narcotic take a pill only once to see what it feels like to be dope sick. The pain of withdrawals is worse than any flu illness you can imagine. I thought to myself, I wish providers would listen more to the addicts. I wish there was such a pill. The whole system would change, in my opinion, to the way this epidemic is being addressed. My daughter is, and what I called, was patient dumped from hospitals on more than one occasion. Hospital staff would tell her there's nothing they, sh they could do, and she would go out 
She would go back into the streets and use again. She would go to the ER begging for help and was treated horribly. She was looked upon as a nuisance. I tried to intervene with talking to the staff, begging them to help my daughter. My conversation with one rude doctor was as follows. Can you please refer my daughter to long-term inpatient treatment? I said, she's black and blue from track marks all over her body. She's bipolar. She's severely depressed. The doctor responded by saying she was well aware of this and she was not eligible for inpatient treatment. I became furious at her and I said, how can this be? The doctor sighed and said, your daughter this, did this to herself and has to want to get clean. I said, she is in your ER and is asking for help. She said again, there's nothing she could do. I responded by saying, so I can expect a phone call that she is dead because when you release her, her chances of overdosing just skyrocketed. The doctor sighed and said, you and every other parent. I could not believe what I was hearing. I will not repeat what I said before I hung up with her. I did, however, threaten to go to the press. I was so furious. Her response was, okay. She, she was only referred to drug treatment facility from the ER on one occasion from Middlesex Hospital. The facility she went to was filthy. There were dealers outside selling and my daughter quickly left. I did not believe her when she told me at first, but more than one person confirmed to me that this was in fact true after seeing this particular facility themselves while visiting a loved one. Also, if you are a member of any support groups, you, you will see how many people testify about the dealers that hang out at certain facilities and sell to the patients. A woman told me a heart-wrenching story of her son overdosing at a facility as he was waiting for his admission assessment. He was having horrendous symptoms of withdrawals and was able to buy heroin on the facility grounds. My daughter did eventually get into mental health and substance abuse treatment facilities. All except one of her inpatient episodes, her duration was just to detox. She has walked out on a few episodes of care due to the lack of respect she was getting from some of the treatment providers. And again, this is not all. There are good treatment providers out there. She often left AMA against medical advice due to feeling diminished and having no self-worth. My experience with the mental health treatment world is there's a huge lack of follow-up. What was promised on a mission didn't always happen. On one occasion, my daughter was supposed to be assigned a caseworker after discharge. The caseworker was supposed to help her find housing, employment, and refer her to a methadone clinic. She could never get a hold of the caseworker, and there were never any calls returned. I tried contacting the caseworker myself and left many messages for her to return my daughter's calls. My daughter became frustrated and went back to using. My daughter's last patient episode of care included going to a rehab program from detox. The completion of the detox and rehab programs were conditions of allowing her to live in our home. I demanded she sign a release so I could be involved in her treatment. I wanted to learn how to help her recover. I wanted to attend a treatment meeting and meet with her clinicians. I was told a number of times that this would happen and it never did. My daughter also kept telling her social worker that I wanted to meet with her and all, and all assigned to her case. The social worker became aggravated with my daughter and said to her, what is it your mother expects me to tell her? Her statement to her daughter, my daughter, disgusted me. If I could ever meet with this social worker, I would tell her, I care deeply for my daughter and I want to learn from you how to support her through a journey of recovery. It's not easy. My experience with the judicial system. As with most addicts, my daughter was involved with some criminal activity. When the instant she was arrested for heroin and paraphernalia possession. When I received a call from the court martial, he told me the best advice he could give me was not to bail her out. I agreed with him and I had high hopes that this was her rock bottom and, she, and hopefully she'd want to get clean. I was shocked to learn she detoxed in pr prison with no medical assistance, with so many people clogging the judicial system with heroin spillover crimes. Why is it there's no substance abuse treatment in prison. Not None that I know of. I could be wrong. Society needs to stop handcuffing addiction, addiction and the court should be mandating drug treatment. I inquired about a jail diversion programs. I called and inquired about the possibility of her opting for treatment instead of jail. A di jail diversion staff person told me she would talk to a social worker assigned to the court 
house and get back to me. I waited and waited until finally I called her back. That same staff person who talked to me previously could not remember our conversation and said, just talk to the public defender. When I then talked to the public defender about my daughter being mandated to treatment, she told me treatment would not be fair to my daughter because she had spent time in jail. Once my daughter was released from jail, she went back to using. Needless to say, I and so many people are fed up and the opiate epidemic is just going to inflate more and more until there are significant changes. The families of addicts are living in a world of darkness and frustration. Not only is the system not working for us, but also the stigma of our loved one not being treated with dignity and respect, nor are they getting the clinical care they should be. We live under a rock of shame, and that rock is heavy to lift when we're up against society judgments. My message to substance abuse providers, when a patient walks through the door, that is someone's son, daughter, brother, sister, mother, father. Treat that patient and family with the grace and care as you would a cancer patient. Also, what really makes me so ang angry is patients being rejected for treatment. It's happening all the time, and this, pa and this sets people up to die. As one mom told me, <clears throat> her son died because his insurance lapsed, and he had to wait five days. In the meantime, he used and overdosed. Another mom called me hysterical a few weeks ago because her daughter finally wants to get help and wants to do so by enrolling in a methadone maintenance program. Her daughter was rejected from the program because she was enrolled earlier in the past year and dropped out. I think it's ridiculous. This is about life or death. I, think, I don't think the patient should be discouraged from trying again. By discouraging people, you are playing Russian roulette with their lives because their chance of fatal overdose will increase. I cringe when an official announces they are addressing the opiate epidemic with supplying Narcon. You are, but don't misunderstand me. We need this life-saving drug, and it should be in every household, but it's a band-aid. It's not the resolution. It is saving lives, but then what? We, the families, want to hear the pharmaceutical companies are being brought to task in regards to their powerful opiate pills. We want to hear of enhanced treatment options, bed availability, and triage staff in the hospitals with helping people with detox placement. We want to see officials standing up to the insurance companies and penalizing them when not providing coverage for drug treatment as described in the Mental Health Parity Act. I, I and myself, another town police officer, Officer Carl Kabenikoff, run a, a closed Facebook drug coalition group. Um, I have business cards on the table. If you're interested in joining our group, we provide a lot of support and education. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kim, uh, for sharing your story. And I know that the commissioner uh, really appreciates hearing that. Uh, she spent, like I said, uh, five hours last night listening to testimony, but uh, not as raw, I think, as Kim has provided for us today, which is why I asked Kim to be here, because like me, she's a straight shooter, and she's going to tell you what it really feels like uh, to be a parent and help uh, children. Um, so again, her information uh, is in the back table, and I've also included that on a Facebook post. So when she says it's a closed group, you're going to have to look for Kim on Facebook, Kim Rich you're going to have to request her as a friend and then she'll add you because obviously those kinds of conversations are very personal and, and so she keeps a very close uh, handle on those things. I just want to uh, mention a couple things uh, before I turn it over to questions. Um, earlier you talked about uh, Representative uh, DeLauro. Actually we are in Representative Joe Courtney's district right now. So I would ask uh, that if you are interested in contacting Representative Courtney to support that legislation to stop the incessant uh, TV ads, please do so. Um, you know, the other day I was watching uh, and they had something on, maybe you've seen it too. It was a prescription for people who have um, 
uh, digestive issues if they're taking o opioids and, and, a, and a pill then to fix the digestion issue. And it's really shocking, right? I mean, Commissioner, I wonder if we need to talk. Let's see if we can do something at the state level too. Um, but anyway, so please reach out to uh, Representative Joe uh, Courtney. Um, also, um, everybody should have gotten one of the flyers or on the back uh, table, on the back table, Everybody's information is there. Rushford is there. Uh, Chief Cox is there. The commissioners is there. Um, Eastern Men uh, the Mental Health uh, Regional Board is there. The LPC is there. So it's all on that flyer. Um, also, just two more quick shout outs before I read the first question. The first is to my very good friend, uh, Jack Herman, who owns Nathan Hale Pharmacy. I uh, approached Jack uh, several weeks ago to ask him to uh, uh, please consider participating in the prescription program so that he could uh, actually fill prescriptions at Nathan Hale Pharmacy. So the doctor is absolutely correct. If you can get that prescription from your family doc, great. But if you can't, um, Jack is in the process of undertaking that class online and he uh, and his staff are ready to help you and Jack is such a great pillar uh, in East Tatum and Moodus and I want to thank him so much for everything he does and also another shout out to East Tatum is my good friend Officer Carl Karimnikov who's standing in the back very shyly but you can't miss him. Uh, he's the guy with a big smile on his face back there and uh, he's one of our uh, local police officers in East Tatum and and um, we actually have gotten to the point where on Facebook, somebody will let Carl know of an issue and he is responding immediately. So um, thank you, Carl, for your dedication. Okay, we, Kim and I, we had talked uh, before this started, but you know, I just want to personally say I, um, I'm, I'm sorry for all that you had to endure as a parent. Um, I applaud you for your, um, for your persistence and perseverance. Uh, uh, addiction is a, it's, it's just a, a tough journey. And so I thank you for, um, for being here, for sharing your story, for helping to raise awareness. Um, what we can talk more um, as well about sort of recommendations you have, but um, you know, one thing I think it's important um, for you to know, but also everyone here in the room that, you know, we do have an office of the healthcare advocate. Um, and I think it's important for people to, um, to call and to advocate um, for yourself, for your loved ones, for your friends, if you know of somebody that is not getting the care that they need and deserve um, in a healthcare system. Um, and so Vicki Veltri um, is the director of that office. That, I think that's one um, you know, important uh, option. Another option is if, it's a, uh, if you're encountering barriers within the DEMA system, um, so if it's an uh, individual on, um, on Medicaid or, and trying to get into one of our DEMA services and, and encountering any of those similar types of barriers, um, call, um, this is my office, the Office of the Commissioner, so 860-418-7000. And, and that, uh, you know, we can also help to address um, any barriers that you may have. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we'll be having a centralized number um, to be able to um, link people to services throughout the state because uh, it, it, there, it, there shouldn't be barriers. I mean, this is, this is a, a absolutely a, a crisis and so we want people to be able to link to the necessary, be able to be linked to necessary services. Um, but, but mostly thank you, Kim, for sharing your story and for being here. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Commissioner, for being so new on the job. I just have to commend you and how uh, heartfelt I feel that your action is. All right, so the first question I have here is probably more deemed for local uh, local folks. We have, uh, the question is, how does the town plan on bringing in drug and, and addiction, I think she means awareness, into the school and to the town? So uh, tell me who would like to uh, answer that, whether that's LPC or Chief Cox. I know we talked a little bit. <laughs> we talked, I get that at appropriations all the time. Um, so maybe you can help that. Um, I know at the high school level, we've had um, a counselor who uh, works under supervision from Rushmore. Um, his nickname is Biff, um, and he has been instrumental in, um, in uh, talking directly with uh, some of the students that um, are really affected by substance abuse. Um, unfortunately, um, he is out of commission right now, 
and um, I do not have current information on how we are replacing him. Um, it is of concern. I know that the local prevention council has uh, brought in um, speakers. Um, uh, Biff actually last year addressed the whole school. Um, and I heard very positive response from the students um, on this. Um, and, um, and so the local prevention council actually has in its budget right now $1,000 to bring speakers um, um, to shed light on um, the substance abuse problems at the high school. Um, at the middle school, um, we have not done a direct um, uh, presentations to the student body uh, about uh, substance abuse. It's more part of the um, health curriculum. Here we've had uh, more um, presentations about um, other things to do or to stay safe, internet safety kind of things. Um, because also, I, Kids are starting very young, so I feel like we need to actually have this at the middle school, but there's also a little bit concern that you might be introducing topics to some kids that they know nothing about yet. So it's a very um, fine uh, balance. Um, I don't know, did that answer the question well enough? I mean, there's so much more that we can do, um, but, but there are definitely things that are there in the works. Uh, thank you. So my suggestion, too, is maybe add that as an item for you to talk about at your next LPC meeting, and maybe there's some uh, more brainstorming and some things you can do uh, as well, maybe possibly locally. Um, so the next question is, what are the plans for better rehab options, longer detox so people can have a better chance uh, for the Vivitrol shot, which we actually didn't talk about, which requires 10 days being clean, and I'm not sure who's comfortable answering that question. When it's important to be in a continuum of, of care. Um, you know, there's some studies that show less than 90 days worth of treatment, and that would include maybe being in a residential treatment program and then some intensive outpatient programming and um, uh, maybe medication-assisted treatment. Less than 90 days is probably not very helpful. It takes a while for the brain to heal from the substances that you know, have been damaging your brain. Uh, insurance companies are the ones that need to understand that and need to pay for those services. At Rushford, we have a full continuum from detox to residential, partial hospital programming, intensive outpatient, outpatient relapse prevention, as well as our prevention department. Uh, so, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. When we talk about medication-assisted treatment, we're not just talking about methadone, we did mention methadone up here, but we're, we're talking about opioid replacement therapies like methadone, but also um, suboxone or buprenorphine is the active ingredient, that's an opioid replacement therapy, but we're also talking about antagonist therapies like naltrexone. Vivitrol is the long-acting form of naltrexone. Naltrexone blocks the receptor, so if someone were to use an opioid analgesic or use heroin, they would not get the effects they're looking for and they would stop using it. You cannot overdose and die if you have naltrexone in your system. Uh, at our residential treatment program in Durham where we treat adolescent boys with substance abuse disorders, when we have someone who comes in with an opioid use disorder, it's um, my primary goal to try to get them and their families on board with the idea that they would leave on Vivitrol and their insurance companies, I should add. Um, that's the biggest uh, barrier usually, but they should leave on Vivitrol because they can't use opioid analgesics or heroin. They will not overdose on those medications and those those drugs and die if they leave on Vivitrol. Uh, thank you very much. And, you know, one of the things I've learned, I spent about two months visiting seven different correctional facilities around the state. And one of the things I learned in my visitation of 
from all over the place was Suboxone is actually the number one um, uh, item that's being uh, tried to be confiscated into our jail system. And so it's important for you to know what Suboxone is. It actually looks like, uh, you know, those um, Listerine pocket packs. You know what those are? They're little strips and you can put them on your tongue. That's how Suboxone is delivered. And when I was talking to one of the wardens, they were telling me that in some cases they were finding them conveniently placed on like the inside of the envelope. So when the person l went to lick it, that's how they would be able to get it. So, you know, this is affecting uh, so many uh, so many of us in so many places. And I think, again, for, the goal here is to have a conversation to bring awareness. Uh, the next question, what programs are in place to aid families of addicts and or those who have served time in prison or halfway house? How can they be helped when they are released? Um, so I'd just like to let folks know about uh, a collaboration we have right now going on with the um, Department of Corrections that, that gets at just that issue. Um, for individuals that are um, in prison and have, um, before being arrested, were on methadone, um, we now uh, have a program with the Department of Corrections where they can continue on their methadone while in prison. Um, and, and so we have a pilot going on with the New Haven Correction Center. Uh, it's a, a collaboration between Demas and Department of Corrections. Um, the good thing about that is if they're able to get the methadone while in prison, um, it helps to reduce the cravings and reduce the, reduce the likelihood that you know they'll um, be engaging in some of the, the um, under the table or illegal ways of getting the uh, medication in, in prison. Um, and so that's one way to help a person um, you know, once they get out of uh, prison, they're already on methadone and, and, uh, and controlled on that medication. And, and the, the thinking is that that will then reduce the likelihood uh, of the person uh, picking up heroin or other opiates. So, Commissioner, to follow up on that, um, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, there was a news story on Channel 8 where they talked about uh, folks who uh, didn't have any transportation and they would spend, did anybody see that all day transferring from bus to bus to bus to get served? And so that's why this is not, uh, this is a larger conversation. Transportation's an issue. There's other things that are at play here. Um, so we need to think about all those things. Uh, the next uh, question is, in these times of tight budgets, what programs like DARE can the state assist local communities to educate children? Um, I'm not sure. I you want to take that too? Okay. So we have a program that we um, administer in schools, but also other communities as well. It's, it's mental health first aid. Um, and it's, it's essentially mental health um, awareness training. Um, it does include addictions and, and um, substance abuse um, content as well. Uh, and that can be done in schools and communities. And it, it's really um, teachers. Uh, it, it's administered statewide. And so that's something that uh, a resource that uh, is currently available. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm going to come over to see one of my, I just have to say, one of the reasons why I invited Christy here is because in my very first term, um, I reached out to do a mental health forum. We held it in Colchester. That's how I met Christy and immediately was drawn to her uh, no frills, uh, tell it like it is personality. Although last night in the Appropriations Committee meeting, she showed up to testify and then put a court jester hat on to show her disdain for our budget. But um, hope. Um, I'm, I'm glad she <laughs> Yeah, oh, well, I'm not going to tell her about her singing. It was very late night. So, Christy, please, thank you. Thanks. Um, so, uh, one of the things I think is, is important to, to think about in schools, and, you know, we've, we've held community conversations in, in other, on mental health in other um, areas, and Old Lyme and Killingworth were two of the areas that we've done in the Middlesex County region. And I think <clears throat> schools are, are tough, a tough nut to crack, if you will, in that um, a lot of times the parents feel a little frustrated that <clears throat> more isn't happening in the schools around um, talking about all kinds of issues, but definitely about drugs. And when, when I went to school, they actually used to do that 
program, I, I think it was like a dare, but they would show kids how to use drugs. So similar to what you're saying, like are you introducing the concept to them? But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't introduce the discussion with them. And that, that you know, you don't necessarily have to show kids how to do this, but you need to talk about what the real um, challenges are and what the dangers are, real dangers are in this, in this world about, uh, about using anything and i think the whole you know get them scared about the one time trying something and that that's the the the, the danger of of addiction is that you don't know uh, how something will affect one person versus another and the pre and the genetic predisposition it's in my family i mean alcoholism is alive and well in my family and it's been passed down in in the male chain if you will but it's really important and it's so maybe not even that the schools have to do it but that you have to do it and to talk about what are some of the dangers um, but the communities in Killingworth and Old Lyme are making some inroads so whether it's through the LPC like joining that are making some inroads with um, with some of the teachers and the administrators because they're kind of forcing the conversation so I would say as parents you need to help really find an inroad whatever inroad that is in the school to say we need some type of discussion or programming around it because as betsy found out with the kids they already know a lot of stuff and so they're laughing about are your parents monitoring your you know uh you know percocet prescription that you got for that knee injury in football hell no you know so what i'm saying is that 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 conversation you kind of need to push it yourselves Thank you so much, and, and this is exactly, uh-oh, hold on, oh, there we go. Phew, I would have been in trouble if I pulled that plug out. So uh, this is exactly why we're having this conversation. It's an opportunity to have a frank, uh, real conversation, and uh, that leads me to my next question. I will preface this, I think this is for you, Chief. I will preface this, that this experience looked like it happened before your tenure, but uh, I wanted to bring this uh, next. Uh, the question is, why was I turned away numerous times at the East, Haddam Police uh, East Hampton Police Department with information such as names, telephone numbers, license plate numbers, and directions of people who sell heroin? Um, it's unfortunate that um, someone had that experience uh, with our agency. Uh, I can tell you we are a new developing agency. Um, I can tell you that so far uh, we've had a number of projects to work on uh, to include, uh, but not limited to, um, you know, we have a 911 center that's closing, so we're working on getting somebody into the 911s come June. Um, we've re rewritten our entire rules and regs manual. Um, and that's probably about the size of the Webster Dictionary uh, on how to handle things. And part of that is a, a complaint against personnel process. So if someone has a concern about a complaint of personnel, we have a process in place. Uh, I'm a, a mandated uh, complaint taker, like any other officer is, uh, under my command. Um, so if you can get a hold of me uh, on my way out, um, I can uh, direct you how to find the form. The form is on our website. The form is also in other town buildings um, to include the town manager's office and I believe the library. Um, but that, that is an unfortunate uh, experience. What I can tell you though is um, please understand that, uh, like I said, uh, the officers under my command wear many hats. And uh, we uh, often, find our time, uh, often find ourselves uh, going to a lot more calls than one might anticipate in town. Um, and please understand that, you know, as a licensed medical provider, we have some a uh, addresses alone that average about 175 medical calls a year, one address. Um, so um, we're kind of divided. Our time is uh, very divided. But um, again, if, if you have a concern about one of my officers, by all means, uh, you can either call me at the number that's provided here or stop by the office. So, Chief, so Chief again, I'm going to note that that looks like it happened before your tenure, they made a note on when that happened. If, if that were to happen today, if, if somebody saw what they thought was drug activity happening, how would they reach out to the department to share that? Uh, I really don't like these. Um, th there are multiple ways. Uh, obviously, you can call us. Um, you can uh, stop down to the office. In fact, I had two people this week come down with information um, who asked, asked to speak with me. As well, we have a, a hotline number that you can call. And, uh, you know, uh, when I got here, there wasn't voicemail systems. There weren't hotline numbers. Uh, they didn't have email. Um, it, 
it was 2013. I really thought we needed it. Um, so unfortunately, we, we've been building from the ground up. My, my next hope is a women's bathroom. I think that's a, I'd really like to get there so we can diversify a little bit. So uh, I've, I've had a, a long road in the first three. Thank you, Chief. And so, um, so if somebody wanted to send that information via email, they could send that to you. And uh, is the hotline on our program, uh, Chief? Okay, so it's on your website. So if you go to the East Hampton uh, Police Department website, uh, it will be there. I'll go uh, tomorrow, if you don't mind. I'm not going to do that tonight. I'll go first thing tomorrow, get that number, and I'll post it on my Facebook page and add it to the note I posted there yesterday with a list of resources for you. Um, the next question, what steps are being taken to extend inpatient long-term care? I think it's been shown that 28-day programs aren't long enough. Anybody? I know it's a hard one, Commissioner. You're getting, you're getting the hard questions. Thank you. So what we've really worked to do within our system is to develop um, a range of uh, treatment programs that will be able to meet uh, people's diverse needs. Because some people might need um, a longer program, others depending upon where they are in their in their addiction or their recovery journey, um, you know, it, detox may not be where they're at. And, and so that's why even I was saying like the assessment number, um, you know, having a good initial assessment is important to be able to identify what the appropriate level of care is. Um, it may be for some individuals depending upon where they are um, in their, um, in their uh, addiction, uh, that uh, a 90 day program uh, may be necessary, a 60 day program, a 30 day program, and we have um, all of those. So we have uh, long term, we have intermediate, um, we have recovery houses, um, we have detox, which are, you know, shorter periods of time. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are a range of uh, possibilities depending upon where a person is. Um, I think mostly what we've tried to do is not create a one size fits all system because we know that. Um, you know, we know that, that people have different recovery needs. Um, and I think as part of that, it's been important for us to develop a range of treatment options um, and recovery supports. You know, I think that's an important piece as well, recovery supports. And so we fund, um, uh, uh, for example, CCAR, um, and they can offer telephone support or um, uh, support with other individuals in recovery who can talk with uh, folks who are uh, on their own recovery journey. So, Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so the next question looks like it has a recipient, which is uh, the doctor at Rushford. Um, doctor, if you could uh, answer the question, why does an individual have to be high to get into detox? Uh, they don't understand that and then they don't feel it's right. And uh, I'm sorry, obviously these questions are going to put a lot of people on the spot, so you're not alone. I, mean, I don't feel put on the spot. That's, that's the, uh, the last point that I forget, you know, that jumped out of my head. It was, it, it, and it's, it's this. Why is it that with mental health and substance abuse problems, you have to be at the final stage of the, the disease has to have advanced to the very nth degree before you can get any treatment approved. So my point is this, if you were to develop, you know, God forbid you were to develop cancer, you, you might know cancer gets staged like stage one, you know, the, the cells have changed a little bit, you do a biopsy, stage two, uh, there may be an actual tumor. Stage three, that tumor is larger and it's involves some of the lymph nodes. You know, in stage four, you've got metastases. You've got tumors all over your body, and the doctor goes, "Oh my gosh, you've got you know X number of years. Your chances of survival are are nil." With substance abuse disorders, um, we don't screen for them. We don't look for the signs and the symptoms of early onset. We don't discourage people f like we should, and we don't understand, we haven't understood the, the effect on adolescents and young adults. Um, and so, uh, you know, oh, that's, that's uh, kids being kids. Oh, you're in the emergency room because you overdosed on a drug? Um, well, you know, we've given you some saline and revived you, so time to go. I was meeting with a group of emergency room doctors, and that's what they 
did. They didn't, and I said, do you guys ever use naloxone? Oh, we always use it all the time. Do you ever give a prescription of naloxone to the family or the person that came in that just overdosed? None of them did. They thought, no, that's a strange, no, that's a thought. Um, but uh, this idea of stages. So for addictions, you get treatment when you have lost your job, you've estranged all of your family members, all your supports, you have no income, and uh, you, your brain has had these changes, so you have tremendous cravings, um, and, and then you have to be uh, intoxicated or sick to, to get it approved. Uh, you know, we really need to push insurance companies. It, it's, it's not true that you have to be intoxicated to get treatment, but um, there's some insurance companies that that's a tremendous fight. Um, they, they, they say, well, you, you have to be in withdrawal in order to get in. You have to be in withdrawal. If you had diabetes, would you have to have diabetic ketoacidosis to get treatment? Of course not. No one wants to see you that sick. You might die. And it's the same thing with addictions. So I, I think it's an excellent question. There, there is a health care advocate in this state. And when an insurance company won't approve and they say, oh, you need to fail first or you need to do poorly in the help, we're talking about drugs that can kill someone the first time they ever use them. And so you need to be in a safe place. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. And so I will also make sure I include Vicki Veltri's contact information. I'll update uh, that as well tomorrow, who is the health uh, health care advocate, uh, which the commissioner uh, just spoke about uh, a moment ago. I'm going to uh, ask this question. I think it's probably uh, again to Chief Cox. Other than East, Had East, I'm sorry, East Hampton Police Department, can all EMS personnel carry Narcon? How does a parent a rel I'll have you answer that, and then the second question you can pass to either uh, folk on either side of you. How does a parent, relative, close friend get a prescription for Narcan? Other than uh, you, uh, can all EMS personnel carry Narcan? Uh, I can answer the first part of the question. Uh, I believe all our uh, emergency personnel from the ambulance uh, corps, as well as the police department, have the Narcan. Um, with respect to how family members get it, that would not be yeah. in my house. I answer to Commissioner, I'm sure you can. Um, th there are, there's a couple of w websites where you can get, uh, you can um, look it up and find out where the, there's a needle exchange program that also does naloxone. Um, I, I can give you those, or the Commissioner might even have those right on her. It, you can put those on your Facebook page as well. So you can go to those websites. The problem is that I think that those, one is located maybe in New Haven and one in Hartford. They're, they're not widely distributed. Those are the two places you can get it for free. As we mentioned earlier, you can go to the pharmacy in town as soon as the pharmacist is certified, and you can get a prescription there, um, but you will probably have to pay for it, unless, depending on your insurance. You can go try that out. Um, you. It, it then becomes more difficult because there's a lot of doctors that don't understand how to prescribe uh, naloxone and, and how do you write the prescription. It's not that it's all that complicated. You can talk to your primary care doctor. You can have them call this pharmacy that's listed here because they will know how to do the prescription. And, and that, would be, that would be one strategy to try to get it done. The other strategy is um, to uh, look for a substance abuse treatment agency. And Commissioner, did you have some other ideas on that? I took all the easy answers. <laughs> I know, those were the easy ones. <laughs> No, no. Um, so certainly, uh, from your physician, uh, many physicians will will um, prescribe, uh, will, will give you a prescription. But again, there there is variability in terms of their um, awareness, willingness, you know, et cetera. Um, uh, I believe some pharmacies now also will prescribe it without a doctor's prescription. Is that yeah. that's yeah. yeah? And I think there is a growing list. Um, yeah, yeah. DCP. Yeah. So DCP. So there is a list. Um, and so I think you know I think the other thing, Department of Public Health. Um, they they also they supply us with our kits. Um, at times we have them in our residential facilities and our um, addiction facilities. Um, and so if if somebody um, if you're having a difficult time getting them, I, I believe they could actually get you some as well. They typically have access to them and are able to get some. So I think that um, would be another uh, option. The, the, they, the other thing to mention is that uh, the law in the state of Connecticut allows prescriptions to be given to family members. You don't have to be the person that has the opioid use disorder. Right. And the law is that the pharmacy should carry 
Right. So, um, you know, and that's a very good point. So the prescription is not just for the addict. It's for the family members. That's the key or the loved ones. So I actually have posted the DCP uh, link on my Facebook page. You can look up that note. Um, my Facebook uh, page information is on your handout. There's a number of pharmacies. And when I started going around in East Hampton about a month ago, personally to inquire to each one of them if they had the ability to prescribe from the pharmacy, not a doctor, but from the pharmacist, uh, in East Hampton, I was told they didn't, which is why I then went to my friend Jack Herman and asked him to uh, consider doing that. So uh, Nathan Hale Pharmacy is in Moodis, um, and uh, they are in the process. He'll probably have already completed. It's an online course through the Department of Consumer Protection. Um, unfortunately, we charge for that. I can't even believe that. Uh, you know, here's a, a people doing a great service, and we they charge them a fee. But uh, Jack is doing that, and then there's a list of other other uh, pharmacies already on my Facebook page. Well, yes. A lot, of people, a lot of people have talked about the naloxone tonight. Uh, please understand, it's, it is a great tool for us, but it's not a miracle in a box. There is a certain point of no return um, and where, where, it's, where it just doesn't work. And also remember, it's temperature sensitive. Can't get too hot, can't get too cold. So storage is key. Um, and that's what a lot of first responders are facing challenges with. So I just don't want what I've, I've talked to some uh, officers in the field from around the state who have used it. Uh, and some have, you know, they run in to try and administer aid and the families are yelling at them to administer Narcan, administer Narcan, and the symptoms don't present for that dosage or for that use. So I don't want people to think that, you know, no matter what, it's going to work. That, that's not the case. Thank you. Um, bring your chair right over here. So um, we're going to take one more question, and then I'm going to introduce somebody very special. Um, so the next question is, uh, Middlesex, Middlesex Court does not have a drug court. Where in individuals who have committed a drug-related crime are prosecuted, what can be done about that? Chicago, Illinois has a drug court that seems pretty good. Uh, an individual is offered detox, rehab, up to three times for drug-related crimes instead of incarceration. Um, does anybody want to talk about a drug court? I know that's nobody here with judicial background. This is a this is a question I can just uh, get the answer to. I can uh, simply get this uh, sent off to the judicial department, and I'll update uh, my Facebook page with that as well. Um, so. I want to introduce to you um, somebody very special who's been sitting here listening to this conversation um, and has ob obviously some real uh, experiences to talk about. And I'm very proud of you for being willing to come forward. I know you weren't planning on it, so I'm very proud of you. This is Brittany Richards. This is Kim Richards' daughter um, that you just heard Kim talk about. <laughs> Pretty great, huh? So um, I knew she was in the audience while Kim was talking and certainly would never have approached her. But when I saw her sitting at the table, I offered her an opportunity to speak to you. And if you don't mind, I'd like to give her that opportunity. Hi. Um, I just wanted to talk uh, a little bit um, about, I guess, experiences. And actually, um, I'm pretty thankful about a lot of things that were said and a lot of people here because um, I don't think that this is um, something that's done a lot and, and that's something that needs to be done um, for addicts because there's a lot out there um, that don't know a lot of this stuff and um, I think that that the fact that um, that that you guys are all coming forward and and helping um, you know, there's a lot of things that I think about, every single one of you um, has said, and um, I think, you know, it's it's really going to be helpful. Um, I wanted to start, uh, you talked about methadone, and um, I'm on methadone right now. Uh, I was a chronic relapser. Uh, I know it's not for everybody, um, but I, I found it very helpful for me. Um, the thing that I like about, uh, you know, the methadone clinics. Um, you know, I know I know it's somewhat hard to get into. Um, I think maybe uh, they they uh, should relax a little bit of the rules because uh, you do need to show um, at least a year ago that you were in treatment. So you need to show at least a year of uh, 
you know, needing it and not working. Um, you know, and I, I just don't think that, that addicts uh, should have to go that long uh, if they want to really get clean. Because I found that um, the first time when you try to get clean, actually, um, you know, you're, you're trying the hardest. And then it just kind of goes downhill from there. Um, and, you know, it's been really helpful for me. Um, but I have a, a chronic pain issue anyways, and, and that's kind of where I started with the pills. So, um, you know, the methadone's good in structure going every day. Um, I, I was on a Suboxone at one point. That's also helpful. You know, it was helpful for me at the time. Um, and I know uh, I've gone to Rushford. Rushford is a good treatment facility. Um, I really liked it. The, the thing that I wanted to say about that, some people have been saying, um, I really do think that uh, detoxes should be lengthened. Uh, I think that they're too too short. Um, that's what I found a lot, like people leaving relapse because you know they're I think they're still going through detox. Um, and I also found that it was hard for me to go into inpatient after a short period of time and be able to focus on the groups that I was in um, while still going through the, these issues. And um, I don't think they give you enough medication when you first go into the inpatient for the groups and stuff. Um, uh, also, uh, I found that, um, you know, different treatment, I, I found that it's it's very generalized right now, and and I think that um, it's good that, uh, you know, and somebody said that, that you really have to focus everybody's individual as far as um, what they need for treatment. <coughs> and, um, you know, not everybody needs the same thing, and, it, and it's very different. Um, you know, people are different, and I also wanted to bring up, which um, we tried not to, but I, I really think that, you know, people should bring this up because it has to do with families as well. Um, with my addiction, codependence is a very important thing that needs to be brought up because I found a lot of people I know, um, you start with somebody that you love, um, and that was the biggest part of my, my addiction is, is not just getting the, the pills to start with, but, um, you know, I also started with a loved one, and, and you just, you know, it, and, and you, you uh, are stuck, you know, and there's, there's not enough uh, treatment for, for codependence, I think, uh, it needs to really be focused on. Um, because I found too that I've tried to go to treatment and detoxes with um, a loved one, and and you're not allowed to go together. So I think maybe there there should be some kind of program where um, you know codependence is is a little bit more focused on. Because I found you know with a lot of addicts, when you, when you're in, you, you know you start going to meetings and you, you start being inpatient stuff. You meet other people and then maybe you start dating and and that's the problem. You you end up with somebody and and then you end up relapsing and then you know it's it's kind of harder to get clean when you have somebody else you know there that's using. So I think uh, codependence should be really um, looked at. Um, and I, I heard actually um, the government governor talking the other day about how they're they're going to be fixing um, family treatment, which I really thought was good. They're going to be, um, you know, trying to set up more counselors and and not taking your your kid away, you know, right away. You know, they're trying to set up, uh, um, you know, people to go to the house and and help people uh, with their families. And I think that's that's really important and good. Um, that I heard about, because um, because I had some issues with DCF too, you know, when I was using, and uh, I just didn't think it was helpful. You know, I think there's there's much more helpful things that that can be done, um, and uh, you know, uh, they do give Narcan when you leave um, detox now, which is nice, um, and they have them at the pharmacies, uh, but. I, I didn't know you, you said that um, you could get them for free because I, I, I saw like the article and it said it was $50 and I just feel like, you know, knowing as an addict you don't spend that money. You don't have, you know, the money to spend $50 on Narcan. Um, so I think it would be important if it's, it's get, given for free. Um, and, and uh, you know, uh, I've been through a lot and, um, and also, uh, I really like the fact that, um, I'm not sure your name, but going to schools and talking to schools, that's really what I f thought was really important because I, when I started using, I knew nothing about being addicted. I didn't think you could get addicted. Um, 
And also you talked about uh, the mental health part of it. You know, a lot of us in addiction also are, are trying to um, overcome pain and, and other traumas, past traumas with addiction. And um, it's, it's really hard, uh, you know, and, and that's why we, the mental health part of it has to be looked at as well. Um, yeah, and I also found that um, using influenced uh, your brain, I know uh, I didn't start till later, I was 23, but it was just, you know, what was going on in my life at the time. Um, but I did find that, you know, it did influence and, and bring out the depression more and the anxiety. And um, also, I think I developed the bipolar more from using that, than I might not have when, if I didn't. Um, um, so I, I think I, I've changed a lot as far as um, because of the drugs. Um, but, um, you know, right now I, I'm on the clinic, which I'm doing well. The thing I like about it, too, is, um, you know, they, they um, if you make, I know some people that started, and if you make a, a mistake in the beginning, you know, they, they don't really throw you out, you know, because I think that's what, you know, I see a lot with addicts is, um, you know, they make mistakes or they relapse and then they get thrown out of, of different, you know, treatments. So I think that, um, you know, they have to, people need to realize that, you know, we can't just always stop. Um, but, uh, you know, thank you guys for all coming and, and saying what you did. I think uh, this needs to be um, said more and brought <clears throat> into the public eye, um, especially, uh, you know, younger kids that are starting really early. They just don't know what you lose. I, I lost everything. I was uh, um, a uh, very good horseback rider. I, I went to UConn. Um, I got a few scholarships to go there. Uh, I was on the equestrian team. Um, came out, I was a, a, a riding instructor. Um, so it was, and I had, you know, a house and, and horses and had my daughter and I had a lot of things that I lost nursing school I went to um, when my daughter was very young um, and I absenced out um, <clears throat> just because it, it was very hard, you know, um, living with a, another addict and myself, you know, um, you know, and just it influenced. I had a 3.9 GPA, I, you know, so I'm not, it, it's not an intelligence problem, you know, I just want to throw out there just to say that just everybody you know, the stigma on addicts sometimes, um, you know, they're, they're really good people. It's just, you know, the, the drugs that are affecting them and making them different. Um, there's a few people I had to bring back that I watched OD'd. I was in a sober house and I had a friend OD right there um, that I had to bring back. And I, I'm just glad I went to nursing school and had, you know, I was certified in CPR. So I brought her back and then I had a loved one this summer um, OD that, that I brought back. So um, I'm just happy I didn't have to see anybody die that I cared about. Um, and, that, and that's a big thing that, you know, we need to focus on so that things get better in this epidemic. Um, you know, you know, people could get help. Um, and, uh, you know, o over the summer also, um, I made a big mistake. I, I, uh, I, I almost killed myself. Um, I jumped out of a dealer's car, I, I got five head fractures, I'm deaf in one ear, you know, so this is just things that, that addicts do and walk away with, um, you know, and, and it's just not them when they're using. Um, so I'm just glad that, that I'm lucky, I feel very lucky that I, that I got help and I am where I am now. And I have to thank my mother too because she, she's helped and my father and my stepmother. <laughs> They will all help me, um, and, and I think that, you know, people need to know that the addicts really need the help and the support. You know, I know a lot of people believe in, like, tough love, and, and, and in some cases that's good to not enable them, but, you know, in some cases afterwards they do need help and, and, and support, and, and my mom has really helped, um, and I'm glad that she's helping so that future people don't, and John, my stepfather, <laughs> so that future people don't have to go through this. And I just don't want to see my, my daughter go through this either. You know, it just, it would kill me. So um, thank you guys for all helping.
Thank you so much, uh, Brittany, for coming uh, forward. And um, it's pretty powerful when you hear uh, what somebody's gone through. But then look at you. It's not just luck, by the way. I just want you to know it. It's not luck. It's hard work. It's dedication. And, um, and you should be very proud of yourself. Uh, we have two more questions, and then if people have questions from the audience, I just want to note it is 25 after 8. Uh, we have many people who are committed to stay right through the end, um, and I know Kim is uh, willing to meet with people privately if you want to talk frankly about some of your uh, questions or concerns. So uh, the next question is, um, as an as a LPC located in Willington, what would you suggest as a course of action we focus on education? and awareness. That's a really broad question. Course of action for what exactly? What is the intent? I think they want to know kind of what should they be focusing on? What are some helpful hints for their LPC as okay. they move forward? Well, I can tell you what we're trying to focus on. Um, you know, it's it's sad that it um, it took three overdoses and two deaths in East Hampton um, for all of us to come together. Um, but I'm also grateful that it brought all of us together. So what we're trying to do as an LPC is to keep the con conversation going. Um, we're um, looking into um, screening um, a couple of uh, films, documentaries, uh, to um, help um, broaden the awareness of the problem. One is called um, The Hungry Heart, and it's a documentary about heroin uh, use in Vermont. And um, the other one. No, the other one is out of Illinois, and um, I'm forgetting the uh, title of it now, but I'm going to be working with uh, our local library to um, to screen those movies and and um, you know have a question and answer after that. Um, also, just to bring um, more speakers to the young people in town. And, and really drive the point home that um, it, it's not something to try. And, um, you know, have speakers that have been through it. it you know, it wouldn't do for me to, to tell them, it, you know, it, it, don't do it because, you know, my life experience isn't anything like that. I think it's more compelling when it's somebody that, that has gone through it. Um, and, and to just generally engage as many people that we can in the community. Um, and um, because it's a community problem. It's not just, you know, the around the corner or, or only in this part of town. It could be anywhere. It could be any socioeconomic group. Um, and, and so we just cannot shut our eyes to this. Thank you. I, I uh, yeah, I think that's a, a really good point, um, and I like the idea of screening with the movies. And I always find food is uh, critical to get people to show up usually to something. So, uh, yes, Brittany, you wanted something to add? Yeah, um, I, I wanted to talk about that too. What I found is uh, a lot of this is happening in small towns, um, like e East ha Hampton, East Haddam, where I grew up. Um, and it's something when I grew up, never thought that it would happen because we're, we're in this small town and this must only happen in the city. Um, but what I found after when I started using, I'm like, and then I, and I realized all my friends that I grew up with were, were also using. And I'm like, you know, oh my God, you know, um, this is happening more in these towns than it is. I found actually, you know, that, that, that kids from the inner city, because I've worked with them um, before as a residential counselor, um, were less involved than, than a lot of people in small towns. So um, I really think, and, I, and that's something I want to do too, is really um, go to these schools and, and talk to these kids because um, they think it, you know, if they do it, then it can't happen to them because they, you know, they, they live in a perfect family or, or this or that, you know, like they said, different things, um, you know. Uh, um, so, so it just would be good to, to tell them, you know, 
somebody that they can, you know, uh, you know, know that that grew up the same way they did, um, and it happened to them. So. Great. I'm so proud of you. You have found your voice. There's going to be no stopping you now, sharing your story. Uh, the last question, then I'm happy to take some questions from uh, the audience, too, if, if you're interested. Um, but I, I want to be real, uh, cognizant of, of certainly their time here, too. Um, so if it's a repeat question, let's try and find new subject matter from the audience. Uh, but the question on the last on the card is, if insurance doesn't cover the Vivitrol shot or you can't afford it, what are the other options after than going back on drugs. The, the, the Vivitrol is is the uh, injectable monthly form, and there, there's an, the oral uh, pill that you take every day is uh, much less expensive than that, and so that is uh, the gold standard is the shot. But the, you can take the pill, so that would be the alternative. Yes, and, and in addition, there are other forms of medication-assisted treatment, so also uh, uh, methadone or uh, buprenorphine or suboxone. Uh, those are other options as well. And so, so there are different options out there. And I just have to take a moment, and um, I just so have to applaud you and, and thank you for um, just you know, sharing your story. Um, I think that you, um, you, you give people hope. Um, I encourage you to continue to do you know, continue to share your story. I would love to talk with you some more. We have um, a group called Super Advocates, and they do just what you just did, yeah. you know, share their story and give other people who uh, are on a similar journey um, hope. Uh, and so I just applaud you, and, and thank you for being here. Thank you for the courage that it took to share your story. Um, you're just awesome. I just want to give you a hug. Oh, you're just awesome. <laughs> All right, um, so that's the end of the questions on the cards. Um, does anybody have a question from the audience? If you do, I'm just going to ask you to come over here and stand here so we can use the microphone. Everybody's all set. They feel like they've gotten a good, a lot of information. Yes, Betsy. I'm just curious. I don't know if the, <coughs> if the toxicology reports came back, but the, the, peop the most recent um, opiate deaths, did it involve fentanyl-laced heroin? Because I know the, the, that's been going skyrocketing, you know, the number of deaths from fentanyl. You don't know that? Okay. So she was asking, uh, this is Betsy Chadwick, she is with the uh, Middlesex, Cha uh, Middlesex, Middlesex County Substance Abuse Action Council. It's a pretty long acronym. And so the question she just asked was about fentanyl. Um, for those who um, are, are curious, there's many combinations or mixtures of heroin, and so they're adding fentanyl to it, which is why you saw those spikes in New London and some other places. All of those stats I just recently, actually, I think this morning, or yesterday updated my Facebook page because this has a huge uh, impact on the chief medical examiner's office and, and others because every time there's an overdose, they are mandated to do an autopsy. So we've heard all the physical, the the loved one impact, the town impact, but at the state level, uh, that agency is in deficiency in their budget by over $400,000 because of autopsies. So uh, I'm just gonna uh, wrap up by saying, oh. Yeah, There's people who have questions. Come right over to the, to the podium. So, um, what got me to thinking what I was hearing today and over the last couple of weeks is that um, their prescription drugs uh, are definitely a gateway to using heroin. Um, and it seems to me that we're prescribing these uh, narcotic prescription drugs to younger and younger people. So is there anything that can be done to um, put a, an age, a minimum age, to get prescribed before you become prescribed these narcotics? Uh, in the state of Connecticut, there's uh, now mandatory continuing medical education credit to maintain your medical license where um, every two years you have to fulfill a certain number of CMEs. One of them is now the safe prescribing of opioid analgesics. That's not directly what you were asking about, but um, there is a there is a big push to rethink there was a new medication that was recently approved and an indication for children for opioid analgesics and with all the information that we have 
yeah, ab about how these types of addictive drugs can impact the developing brain, uh, it gives you pause. Um, you know, what can be done legislatively, things can be done, but I, I think that the biggest push is around education, um, mandating that physicians use the PMP, and there, there are new, there are new uh, recommendations coming out from the Center for Disease Control regarding the prescribe, prescribing of opioid analgesics, um, and, and those recommendations actually uh, tremendously decrease the okay ability of writing a prescription for opioid analgesics for pain. And doctors nowadays, I believe, they're much younger than me, the ones that are being trained, are learning about the risks of these addictive medications. And, um, you know, it's important to treat pain. That's a good thing. But um, using the, your biggest hammer in your toolbox from the start is not the way to do it. There's hot packs, there's cold packs, there's uh, physical therapy. And this is, this is, this is really what, what uh, your pain medicine doctors are using as well as injections. And there's TENS units, which is an electrical. There's a lot of different ways to treat pain, but that's not the way we were trained. We were trained, you have to treat it, and you had to treat it regulatory reasons. You had to treat it or you get in trouble. But we're, it was like uh, people started using the biggest hammer. It worked, and it worked really well until it didn't work so well. So I just want to say, with this prescription monitoring program, somebody gave a stat to us the other day that there's about 27,000 27, doctors, that's all, right? 27,000? And 22 are, are using the PMP, this prescription monitoring. So there's about 9,000 left to kind of really sign up, sign up to use this. So they've come a long way in getting doctors to use this. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it's important to add. Yeah, uh, that's your pet peeve, I'm very well aware. <laughs> One of the things I know about the prescription monitoring program is I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the pharmacists have up to seven days to enter the data. Um, it's supposed to change. Yeah, I, I heard there's supposed to be a new application where it's point of sale. Um, <clears throat> but, the you know, I was told... <sighs> I had a doctor's appointment last week and I kind of inquired with my medical doctor who is, is a very good doctor, so this is no bash against him, but uh, I find that he, he said in his office, for example, the girl was there typing into his treatment plan, the whole bit, the electronic medical worker, he had somebody, and he says, well, I, I, I guess the state won't allow for anybody but doctors to have access to it, and he says he wants them to allow for their nurses to have access, the he said. Can. The nurses can, but you can't have your office manager. Right, right, and he says because it takes time to check every patient, mm -hmm. so. Uh, thank you, and you know, I'll just add that, uh, unfortunately, the deadline for bills was uh, last week. I did put in a couple bills, one, uh, for treatment beds, to expand treatment beds. We actually have a fund at the Capitol where we take proceeds from drug dealers. It's called the Drug Forfeiture Asset Account. Um, that actually had a balance when I did some digging, so my bill is to sweep all those accounts, about $1.5 million, to, in fact, fund beds. Um, it didn't might not get raised for a public hearing, but I'm working on it. And um, but I would just say, if you have ideas, uh, to, especially to you, uh, uh, doctor, about how we can amend, especially the prescriber age limit for kids, um, please get that to me because there's certainly I'm very apt now at filing amendments on the floor of the chamber. So um, there are other ways besides filing a bill that we can get movement.